Health. Um, I'm the panel chair, and I'm also going to be moderating this panel. So before we begin, I just would like to uh, lay down some ground rules to make sure that this panel will go smoothly and we'll have an interesting discussion to, uh, going. Um, every panelist will speak uninterrupted for the duration of the time that they uh, are allocated. And then there's going to be a very brief moderated session followed by Q&A. So if you have any questions or remarks that you'd like to share, we're uh, open to hearing it at the end. There's going to be two uh, mics um, and probably question lines forming at both ends of the uh, of the editorial. So to begin with, so we can make the uh, discussion a little bit more nuanced, I'd like to give a quick introduction for uh, the BDS movement. The BDS movement officially started on July 9, 2005, with a call by 170 Palestinian organizations representing a wide spectrum of Palestinian civil society to put pressure on Israel to comply with international law. <coughs> it was deeply inspired by the South African movement to end apartheid. The BDS call had three specific demands, ending the occupation and colonization of all Arab lands and dismantling the wall, recognizing the fundamental rights of the Arab Palestinian citizens of Israel to full equality, and respecting, protecting, and promoting the rights of Palestinian refugees to return to their homes and properties as stipulated in UN Resolution 194. But it's also important to, before we begin, to provide a historical context for the BDS call. It came several months after the Sharm el-Sheikh summit, um, which many believed signaled the end of the second Palestinian uprising. Also, um, following the death of Yasser Arafat the year, early, the year before, the Palestinian National Authority was being reshaped and a new era of security coordination was about to begin. Also, Israel was uh, building its wall and was continuing with further construction without uh, with dismissing international condemnation. So the BDS came as a last resort of sorts. Today and nine years after the initial call, BDS has proven to be a viable approach to raise awareness and engage the public in the fight for Palestinian rights. Its decentralized structure made it a very hard tactic to, to counter. But at the same time, its micro-scale approach uh, made it difficult to assess its true impact on, on Israeli policy. It's hard to know if BDS placed any real pressure on Israel. After all, Gaza is uh, in rubbles and more settlements are being built as we speak. However, earlier this year, uh, Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu spent half of his keynote address to the APEC annual conference attacking the BDS movement. The other half was dedicated to Iran. He described BDS as morally wrong, deemed to fail, and that it should be vigorously opposed. Those remarks are a sign that BDS could potentially be on a trajectory to have an impact on Israeli economy and public image and eventually its policies. <coughs> in the US, the BDS has not enjoyed the same level of success as in Europe, uh, but it's gaining noticeable momentum. Last year, the American Study Association voted to boycott Israeli universities. Earlier this summer, the Presbyterian Church USA divested from multinational corporations with direct ties to the occupation. Actually, only last month, the Connecticut Conference of the United Church of Christ approved a resolution calling for divestment from companies, some of which were targeted by the Presbyterian Church before. So the movement is definitely gaining some momentum. But it is obvious that if any of those actions were viewed separately, it would be hard to see how it could pressure Israel into changing its policies in the occupied territories. But viewing the collective of BDS initiatives paints a different picture. Israeli occupation representatives, supporters, and profiteers are held accountable for the crimes of the Israeli occupation against the Palestinian people at every possible venue. This will undoubtedly grow into real pressure. But some say that this eventual impact would come too late, far after Israel has consolidated its grip on the occupied territories, or that the tactics are not tailored for their target audience, or that they might divert attention from the plight of the Palestinians to something else. This panel will delve deeper into those questions. So this panel will have two sections. The first section will uh, be from we'll hear from activists and ad advocates that worked on BDS initiatives directly, and then the second part will uh, talk about the theoretical framework of, of BDS with specific focus on tactical approach. We will then have um, questions at the end. So our first speaker is uh, Dr. Thomas Abboud, who teaches
teaches in the Arabic program and department of anthropology at Tufts University. He's been involved in activist and scholarly uh, projects related to the Middle East for the last two decades, including the BDS. He was involved in the successful American Studies Association effort in 2013. Thanks everyone for coming and to the organizers as well. I am going to be very brief because I'm, I'm compelled to and I'm going to tell you a little bit about the American Studies Association resolution that successfully passed about a year ago and uh, I was involved in it in my own very modest way and I want to say also uh, beyond that that I uh, do not speak for the organization, I just speak for myself. Uh, so please, uh, my views are mine, uh, and ASA is made up of a, and this resolution was put together by a diverse set of ideas about BDS and about the politics of Israel-Palestine more generally. Can you all hear me back there with this? Okay. So it's interesting, ASA was uh, the victory, the resolution passed among the membership two to one, but it was actually not the first resolutions that was successfully passed at a U.S. professional scholarly organization about four or five months previously, previous to December of 2013, the Asian American Studies Association also passed a resolution. They often don't get the credit for being uh, before ASA, but in both resolutions, very, very similar language was used. I don't have time to unpack all of the, the resolution right now, but what both resolutions shared in terms of language was the following. Uh, statement that ASA, quote, endorses and will honor the call of Palestinian civil society for a boycott of Israeli academic institutions. I'm going to talk a little bit more about what, how the ASA resolution came into being and some of the, the strategies and tactics used. But before, before doing so, I, I want to say something important that's, uh, that I believe is more, a more general point that needs to be stated. Uh, that's often missed in these discussions and debates. And that is that there are many, in fact, many B, D, and S efforts and initiatives that have taken place over the last uh, decade or so, and even before. People like scholars and activists like Noam Chomsky and Edward Said were involved in this activism and this kind of uh, nonviolent uh, political action work long before we have this budding uh, but promising uh, BDS movement known today. One campus effort that I was familiar with, and one of the earliest ones, uh, was organized at my alma mater, Columbia University, among faculty at, in around 2003-2004. And it had as its focus a demand that was very much more narrow. And that's why I'm saying that the, the various ways in which a, a BDS, a boycott, divestment, and or sanctions program can be put together, can be more narrowly done or more broadly uh, uh, configured. The Columbia University faculty initiative was interesting because it, 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 was, it was more narrowly defined and, and articulated, and I want to just uh, read what it did and what it, what it said and why it was, by several measures, successful. So the faculty had as its focus a demand to make the, to demand that the Columbia administration divest from co corporations that operate in and profit from Israel's military rule in the territories occupied in 1967. You see how it's narrowed down and qualified. It was a demand that asserted that, quote, by divesting, by divesting from companies that do business with the occupation, we can put global pressure on the Israeli government to end it. Now, the ASA's resolution, which you can read and which I won't go into uh, much now, as I mentioned, uh, you can read it online, and I, I encourage you to. Not only the text of the resolution, but the, the National Committee also put together an explanation for sort of historical and, and, and uh, political context for it. It endorses and honors the call of Palestinian civil society for a boycott of Israeli academic institutions. I want to emphasize, and ASA has wanted to emphasize, that it targets institutions, not individual Israeli scholars. This is a resolution, this is not preclude Israeli scholars from coming and giving talks at, at, on American campuses. It is uh, a refusal by the ASA in its official capacity to enter into formal collaborations with Israeli academic institutions. ASA answers the question why an academic boycott in a couple of ways. 
one of which is by citing the depth of the partnership between Israeli universities and the Israeli security military establishment in Israel. And I'll just give you two examples that were given by ASA in making this case. One is uh, that, that schools like Hebrew University and Haifa University have, have really quite close involvement in special programs for military intelligence and training for the Shin Bet, uh, an organization many of you are familiar with in this room, an Israeli organization known for its torture techniques, torturing Palestinian political prisoners uh, as young as 12 years old, uh, maybe even younger. In addition to that, other universities like Tel Aviv and Hebrew University, it must be emphasized, are, are built, and in the case of Hebrew University, and I've seen this with my own eyes, built in part on land stolen from Palestinians since uh, the 1967 uh, occupation of East Jerusalem. I don't have time to go into it now, but check out the Israeli journalist Amira Haas's coverage and work uh, on that. Uh, particular case. These are families, if anyone's been to Hebrew U, these are the Edelstein dorms that sort of form a, a semicircle around uh, 12 Palestinian families in about seven or eight homes that have for several decades lived under the threat of being thrown off this land, which the Israeli state now regards as Hebrew universities, uh, part of their campus. Uh, the successful effort was accomplished by efforts to persuade one of the things I wanted to emphasize is that this ASA, I saw it from the beginning, and it took several years to put together and, and finally bring to a vote and pass, several, meaning five or six or seven. And I was involved in those conversations, and what I thought was really important about, uh, the reason why I think the, the resolution ultimately passed is because uh, originally most of the membership, probably, I would say, you know, probably half the people who ended up voting for it initially were, were very, very uh, confused about it or were opposed. And it was through uh, careful persuasion and dealing, trying to deal as ethically with these questions, asking questions like why, you know, why single out Israel, which is a typical, typically articulated question. The contemporary uh, campaign, though, as other uh, panelists will soon, I'm sure, uh, share with you, was inspired by earlier activism. And I mentioned two examples. One, uh, one very important force was one of our panelists. Uh, but in 2002, let me just say that uh, Bishop Desmond Tutu intervened in a way that was very important in the pages of the nation, and I think in the editorial was published elsewhere. And he's, he's showing solidarity not only with the Palestinian people, but also uh, talking about parallels between the struggles, which are not identical. But this, these are his words, and this, this is what I think is important about the passage. He said, quote, we South African and anti-apartheid activists would not have succeeded without the help of international pressure, in particular the divestment movement in the 1980s. Over the past eight months, a similar movement has taken shape, this time aiming at an end, L listen to the language and, and how he narrows this, aiming at an end to the Israeli occupation of Palestinian territories captured during the 67 campaign. Now, this opens up real debates because U.S. ACME has three guiding principles which I support myself, but which are, uh, uh, not principles that everyone who would, say, support the Columbia University Resolution or others that focus just on the 67 territories uh, would. Uh, so I want to emphasize that, maybe in conclusion, that one can support BDS, and this is a real confusion in the movement I, I want to point to right off the, the top. One can support BDS without supporting every BDS initiative. That does not make you, if you say oppose the ASA resolution, it doesn't necessarily make you anti-BDS. Uh, and that's important. As we're dealing with tactics and going forward, let's try to, those interested in moving this uh, politics forward, remember that a tactic, whatever tactic we use, has to be beneficial to those you're in solidarity with, not harmful to the people you claim you're in solidarity with. Secondly and lastly, a tactic should be assessed, I believe, by the educational value it holds. You pursue a particular political tactic to educate people, not because you think that this in the short or medium term is gonna bring down the Israeli economy or, or stop the settlement drive, but you engage in these tactics, I think, to educate people so that they can go on and, and more effectively organize against Israeli military occupation, against Israel's racist legislation, and for the right of the Palestinians to return. Thank you.
uh, was right on time. Exactly. Um, so our next uh, speaker is, uh, and by the way, for speakers, you're more than welcome to stay at the table or come to the podium, whatever you feel uh, more comfortable with. Um, our next speaker is Andrew, Andrew Cotton. He's a member of the steering committee of the U.S. campaign to end Israeli occupation. He has worked on campaigns calling on artists not to play in Israel, um, as well as calling for boycott of cultural ambassadors of Israel, artists who receive special support to play in the U.S. Recently, he was involved in a campaign calling on the Brooklyn Book Festival to reject Israeli government funding at future, fe at future, future festivals. Khadi has uh, also worked on long-term campaigns targeting Israeli settlement companies, as well as U.S.-based nonprofits supporting the Israeli occupation. Andrew? Can everyone hear me okay this way? Excellent. So, over the past decade of my involvement in activism around Palestinian rights, I've gone to a lot of protests. Ultimately, screaming and shouting at protests lets off a lot of steam and expresses our anger, but without tying it to something, it is short-lived, not a sustainable means of addressing our complicity and support for Israel abroad. With my introduction to the Palestinian call and the tactic of BDS, I began to feel the work I was doing was aimed in the right direction and somewhat measurable in its success. I began to work with Adana in New York on their campaign targeting Israeli settlement builder and diamond mogul Lev Levayev. Conversations with Palestinians in several West Bank villages and Israeli anarchists who protested there led us to understand that he was constructing settlements there, but also opening a new store in New York City. After significant research, we began to make our move. We had found out that his, com his company was actually committing human rights violations in Angola and Namibia, <clears throat> and subsequently found a connection to a human rights organization in Angola, tying that into our work. We contacted UNICEF and Oxfam, who he had bragged about charitable donations to, and the former announced it would no longer work with him while the latter declared he was a liar. We found celebrities featured on Levi's website wearing his jewelry, and through a months-long campaign of contacting all of them, Often through their PR agents, we noticed one celebrity, then two, then the entire section disappear from his website. Those celebrities included Halle Berry, Drew Barrymore, Selma Hayek, and others. Throughout the campaign, we worked with Norwegians, Swedes, and others on campaigns targeting large investments in Levi's company, leading to the divestment of BlackRock, as well as Norwegian, Dutch, and Swedish pension funds from his flagship company, Africa Israel. Eventually, we were even able to work with a group in the UK on a campaign targeting the UK government for attempting to rent its embassy space from Levayev, subsequently resulting in a special parliamentary session, uh, resulting in the Foreign Office of the UK announcing, well, denouncing Levayev, his settlement building, and announcing that they wouldn't rent a space from him. All of this is to say that twice, in 2010 and again just weeks ago, Levayev's flagship company, Africa Israel, has announced an end to their involvement in settlement construction and maintenance. <laughs> Similarly, Fiolia, a French multinational involved in Israel's occupation and settlement enterprise, has lost over $20 billion worldwide due to concerted campaigns to cancel its contracts or reject its bids in various cities across Europe, and most notably just a year ago in the U.S. city of St. Louis. The most notable campaign that you may have heard of as of recent is the campaign targeting SodaStream, an Israeli company whose manufacturing plant is in the occupied West Bank. The campaign targeting SodaStream received a notable boost in coverage when they signed actress Scarlett Johansson as their spokesperson. It is a common tactic for Israeli companies mired in any controversy to use well-known names to brand themselves. See Ahava and Kristen Davis. The state of Israel itself has expressed the importance of using branding and formally launched a campaign dubbed Brand Israel. Quote, we will send well-known novelists and writers overseas, theater companies, exhibits, said the Israeli Foreign Ministry's Deputy Director General for Cultural Affairs in 2009. Quote, this way you show Israel's prettier face, so we are not thought of purely in the context of war. It is precisely for this reason that a cultural boycott of Israel has become so important. A state that seeks to use the cover of glamour, art, and celebrity to whitewash its crimes while maintaining a normal status in the world body is susceptible to a boycott. A look at Hebrew and English language Israeli news sites like Yediot Ahrenot, Walla, Ma'ariv, and Haaretz shows significant numbers of commenters when the topic of an artist cancellation arises. In fact, almost regularly, there are far more comments on such articles than there are about Israeli settlements, Israel's occupation, or its unique form of apartheid inside the state towards its Palestinian citizens of Israel. 
For black South Africans, the cultural boycott was critical in challenging the apartheid regime's proud participation in international sporting events, including the Olympics, cricket, and notably, most notably, rugby. Many artists refused to perform in South Africa. A song released by United Artists Against Apartheid, which included U2, George Clinton, Peter Gabriel, Hall and Oates, declared that they would not play Sun City, a resort town and concert venue that was being used and aimed at undermining the boycott of South Africa's apartheid regime. In the US, I believe protests against Israeli team participation in sporting events has only recently begun taking off, most notably with a protest at the Barclays Center in Brooklyn against a Maccabi Tel Aviv game and joint fundraiser for the Israeli army. But artists ranging from Elvis Costello to Snoop Dogg, a moral beacon, of course, have canceled their concerts in Israel. Singers Cassandra Wilson, Kat Power, and Sinead O'Connor, rapper Talib Kweli, guitarist Carlos Santana, Stevie Wonder, who was for some reason scheduled to fundraise for the Israeli army, have all refused to be complicit in attempts to whitewash the state of Israel and its practices. The famed US show House, in fact, uses Massive Attack's teardrop song as its theme, but how many folks here know that Massive Attack has not only refused to play in Israel, but publicly called for a boycott of the state? How about Roger Waters of Pink Floyd fame, acclaimed filmmaker Mira Nair of Monsoon Wedding, or Alice Walker, the author of The Color Purple? On the note of authors, the Brooklyn Book Festival, just mentioned, was recently criticized publicly for accepting funds from the Israeli government, and most notably by a recent endorser of the boycott of Israel, author and MIT professor Juno Diaz, as well as dozens of other notables. What about all of the artists who have gone, you might ask? It is true, many artists, especially from the US, still perform in Israel. And yet even those who do, despite campaigns calling on them to cancel, contribute to the conversation in the media around Palestinian rights and the reasons that a boycott of Israel exists. Leonard Cohen was slated to perform in Israel in 2009 during a campaign targeting him. His, during a camp, campaign targeting him, his PR team went so far as to try to establish equilibrium by scheduling a West Bank concert, playing both sides. Palestinians canceled it. Then he announced that Amnesty International would manage a peace fund for supposed Israeli-Palestinian peace NGO, meaning Amnesty would help undermine Palestinian civil society. Amnesty withdrew. By the time it was all done, Turkey had seen its first ever cultural boycott protest among a dozen total globally, and Leonard Cohen had been branded by his decision. Most notably so in a 2010 article in the Jewish Daily Forward contrasting artists who canceled with those who played, including Leonard Cohen. It became a question of who crossed the picket line versus who did not. In that same article, a top Israeli promoter announced that he had offered artists, 15 artists, major artists, the kind of pay they would receive at Madison Square Garden, and all 15 declined to play in Israel. Macy Gray, in fact, was scheduled to perform in Israel in 2011, posting on Facebook asking whether she should or shouldn't play. Despite personal conversations with boycott organizations and an in-depth explanation of Israeli policies, and the reasons for a boycott, as well as a full-blown campaign, Gray went on to play. Yet her Facebook post was both an indication of how far the cultural boycott had made it and generated a lot of media. Nearly every one of those articles would go on to mention Palestinian rights. Months later, Gray renounced her performance and said she would not have gone had she understood what she saw once she went Andrew, can we, uh, you have like 30 seconds. Sorry, finally, Alicia Keys recently played after an international campaign calling on her to cancel. Key's concert may have single-handedly taken the boycott question to another level with massive coverage, especially in black media, where several writers lambasted Keys for her concert, and notably letters from Alice Walker and prominent African Americans compared policies in Israel to those of Jim Crow. Meanwhile, Idan Rachel, the artist who seemingly convinced Keys to stay the course and has since publicly appeared with her, garnering her praise, is a self-professed -pro propagandist for brand Israel and a proud supporter of the Israeli army through his organization, thank Israeli soldiers. The Israeli government has called him possibly its best ambassador, and his presence in the US has led to protests of his concert, notably one coming up. Ultimately, the boycott of Israel will not change the situation of Palestinians overnight. In fact, Israel's abuses against Palestinians, including citizens of Israel, will likely become worse before ending altogether. But it is the least we can do to address our own complicity in their decades-long oppression. Next speaker is Reverend Jeffrey uh, Dio from the Presbyterian Church USA.
uh, the Israel-Palestine Mission Network. In 2010, 2012, 2014, he authored resolutions calling for uh, divestment from corporations profiting from the Israeli occupation in Palestine. With that effort finally um, bringing results this past June, he presently uh, serves a local Presbyterian congregation in Fort Myers, Florida. Just to give you a sense uh, of what the Presbyterian Church is, it's an ecclesiastical institution that's made up of about 1.75 million people in the United States. Uh, it is a representative democracy, uh, and it's actually one of the factors that influenced the size of the Congress in a democracy, although they don't do it right anymore. Uh, Presbyterians still try to do it right. Um, we elect commissioners to go to a national assembly every two years, and those commissioners come from the 10,000 Presbyterian churches all over the United States. So we elect local people to make decisions for the Presbyterian Church, and initiatives that are passed by the Presbyterian Church come from local congregations all over the country. So uh, it, it drifts up. And when local Presbyterians have a concern, they can bring it to our National Assembly if they cross all their T's and dot all their I's. Um, so in 2004, a good full year before the uh, call by the Palestinian Civil Society, a local church in Gainesville, Florida, uh, sent an initiative to the General Assembly that year to divest from Caterpillar because they took a local church trip and wound up in the West Bank and saw where the homes were demolished and heard the story and came back so incensed, they went to their local congregation, to the board that rules that church, and said, we're incensed about this and we want to send an initiative to the National Assembly. And they succeeded. And it, it surprised everybody. And the long and short is that uh, Presbyterians, if you don't know Presbyterians, we can't just do something suddenly. It takes a while. And uh, you have to assign it to a committee that's going to study it for a while. And so they did that. And it happened to be the, the committee that's responsible for um, uh, overseeing all Presbyterian investments. And Presbyterians, by rule, cannot invest in alcohol, firearms, gambling, or anything having to do with non-peaceful pursuits. This most definitely qualified for non-peaceful pursuits, although there are a lot of Presbyterians who didn't see it that way, and they're ready to fight it tooth and nail. Uh, the long and short is that this company began to study it, and it kept studying it, and kept studying it, and they engaged in corporate engagement with these companies, because more companies were added, not just Caterpillar. And they continued that for years. And right before every National Assembly, these companies that were not cooperating would suddenly start doing a little dance. And they would pretend they were cooperating so the committee would be satisfied and the committee could report to the General Assembly that, that, that they're cooperating. In the meantime, local congregations from 2004, every two years, kept sending divestment overtures to the National Assembly. And... Um, and then in 2004, the organization of which I'm a moderator, the Israel-Palestine Mission Network, was brought into being by the General Assembly of the Presbyterian Church. And so this organization, which is primarily an advocacy organization in the Presbyterian Church to give voice to Palestinians and to work for Palestinian justice, began working with churches and local areas to bring these initiatives forward. And as a member, as the advocacy chair of this network, um, I began to write these initiatives, as was mentioned, starting in 2010. We kept trying and kept trying, and we had all kinds of strategy to do it. Um, but we also were wanting to respond to the BDS call. Divestment was one part. But we also, in 2010, were able to get the Presbyterian Church to uh, call upon the, the U.S. government and the administration to, um, to give military aid to Israel only in accordance with U.S. law, which meant because it's an illegal occupation, uh, that meant that giving that military aid to Israel is, is against American law. 
The, the Presbyterian Church in 2010 voted to do that. In 2012, I wrote an overture to boycott um, Israeli settlement goods, and that got passed. And it's funny because we wrote it, uh, we were trying to get divestment passed, and I wrote the boycott overture to draw fire so we could get divestment passed. Divestment lost in boycott one. Um, and then in 2014, uh, with a very close vote, uh, we finally got um, divestment passed. So as we, can pass, as we can do it structurally as an institution, the Presbyterian Church, as best as it can uh, in its process, has responded to the call to BDS uh, with three separate actions. And uh, we, we also, in 2014, called for the Presbyterian Church to conduct a two-year study and come back in 2016, uh, studying whether or not Presbyterian policy should continue to be a policy that supports a two-state solution. So that's where our church is at this point. The Israel-Palestine Mission Network keeps pushing the church. We're out on the edge. There are Presbyterians who really, really hate us, but we don't care. <laughs> Companies, uh, uh, the three companies we divested from, Caterpillar, HP, and Motorola Solutions, represent about $21 million uh, of our portfolio. Our uh, next speaker is uh, Dr. Youssef uh, Muneya. He's the executive director of the Jerusalem Fund and its educational program, the Palestine Center. Prior to joining the Palestine Center, Munayir served as a policy analyst for the American Arab Anti-Discrimination Committee, the nation's uh, largest Arab American membership organization. He's written extensively on Palestinian rights and the BDS. You said? Thank you uh, very much, Ahmed. Thank you to all the organizers here for uh, arranging this panel and to my co-panelists for their presentations. Um, I'm honored to be uh, asked to share my perspective with you about this very important topic, the BDS movement. Uh, in recent years, this movement, which has grown steadily, has been the topic of controversy in the mainstream and also a subject of debate in progressive circles. It's a topic I've written and spoken widely on in a variety of forums, and earlier this year I participated in a forum hosted by Nation Magazine Online, uh, along with Professor Chomsky, who's with us here today, and others on this very issue, and I'd recommend it to those who are looking to dive deeper on this question. What I'd like to do today is try to answer three questions. First, why is BDS necessary? Second, what is the goal of BDS? And third, what form should it take? Let's begin with why BDS is necessary. To ask the question is to assume that BDS is necessary, and I do believe that to be true. I do not, however, wish that to be the case. In fact, I do not prefer the BDS method. I would much, I would much rather see state actors behave responsibly and use their leverage to change Israeli behavior vis-a-vis -vis the Palestinians. The very fact that BDS, a civil society initiative, is necessary today is a result of the failure of the state and interstate system to deliver for Palestinians. That failure is obvious, but for the uninitiated, suffice it to say that Palestinian human rights, which are protected by international law yet are denied by the Israeli state, have not been supported by the state and interstate system. Rather, it is because of that system's failure that the Israeli state is able to continue to act with impunity. This is clear every time the supposed mediator, the United States, casts its veto in the UN Security Council to shield Israel from international opprobrium. The Washington-dominated peace process has been a farce and acted only as a cover for continued Israeli colonization of Palestinian territory. Today, there are nearly triple the number of settlers in occupied territory than there was before the famed Madrid Conference in 1991. 
these settlers and settlements act as both, both physical, political, and economic disincentives to an Israeli withdrawal from the West Bank. In short, if the peace process has done anything, it has made the likelihood of a viable, sovereign, and contiguous Palestinian state in the West Bank as close to zero as possible. Washington is very clearly pro-Israel, with little interest in genuinely solving the Israeli-Palestinian issue. Many ask if this will remain this way forever, and if it can change. Some will point to signs of progress, both in public opinion in the United States and globally as a reason to think the United States might modify its policy. Perhaps that can be the case. But in the meantime, Palestinians continue to live with rights denied, and many in abject squalor and refugee camps on top of that. So what are people of conscience to do? BDS is an opportunity for civil society to act and achieve what state actors have either failed to do or do not care to do. It allows the average person to maximize their potential to impact the situation through their own economic choices and through the actions of institutions they are involved in. Further, it allows those of us whose tax dollars go to supporting the Israeli system of injustice to address our own complicity in the matter. Last, and perhaps most importantly, responding to the BDS call, a call from Palestinian civil society, allows us to act in solidarity with those on the ground calling for our help. So what then is the goal of BDS? The goal of BDS is twofold. The first and perhaps most obvious goal is to create pressure on the state of Israel. The idea here is that under growing pressure, decision makers in Israel will recalculate the policies that deny Palestinians their basic rights. There is great hope for this endeavor because the Israeli state is only able to continue to behave the way it does precisely because it faces very little costs for that behavior and in fact reaps many political and economic rewards instead. There was a time prior to the Washington-led peace process where the Israeli state was forced to pay much higher costs for the occupation. Prior to the creation of the Palestinian Authority, Israel bore the burden of administering the bulk of the Palestinian population's civil affairs. And now, with the development of the Palestinian Authority's security forces and their renowned security collaboration with the Israelis, the Israeli state has effectively subcontracted a large part of the occupation to them. Defense consumption in Israel in relation to GDP today has halved over the peace process period, meaning the economic toll of the occupation on the Israeli state's economy is less of a burden today than it has ever been. At the same time, the economic benefits of occupation through the usurpation of the land and its water and mineral resources is very significant. In short, Israel's posture towards the Palestinians is made possible by this equation. BDS aims to tip the scales in the other direction to the greatest extent possible. While it would be naive to believe that the BDS movement can do this quickly, or even independently, it would be equally naive, if not more so, to believe that Israeli behavior would change without pressure. The second goal of BDS, which I believe feeds back into the first goal, is education and raising awareness. These days, because of BDS initiatives, as the Reverend mentioned, Americans at Presbyterian Church conventions in Detroit, for example, which is 6,000 miles away from the West Bank, are having heated discussions about home demolitions in the West Bank and Gaza, and are talking about the systems of control that Israel uses to restrict Palestinian movement through checkpoints. These are conversations that simply would not be happening without BDS initiatives, and they're happening across the country. This is the kind of educational impact at the grassroots level that did not exist a mere 10 years ago. And I would argue that it is a factor in the shift in American public opinion on this issue in general in recent years. As the public becomes more aware of Israeli violations of Palestinian rights, it's less likely to support American or uh, economic uh, or military aid from America to Israel. So then what form should BDS take? This has been a question that has perhaps invited the most debate. Some argue BDS should only target companies that profit off the occupation. Some argue BDS should only target companies that operate inside Israeli settlements. I believe these perspectives are problematic and flawed for several reasons. First, separating the occupation from the state is unrealistic. In fact, the occupation is state policy. 
The settlements, which have become more acceptable to oppose in the mainstream today, do not sprout up upon hilltops in the West Bank on their own. They are, in fact, the product of calculated state policy. They are financed through the central government. They are defended by the state's military, and so on. There's no separating the occupation from the state. Second, the, this false separation feeds into a dangerous and erroneous narrative promoted by many liberal Zionists. This is a narrative that holds that Israel within the green line is a liberal democracy and just has this minor occupation problem that it has to sort out. This is a narrative that completely ignores the plight of Palestinian refugees and the fact that the so-called liberal democracy that they champion was built at the expense of a people dispossessed and through their perpetual exclusion. It is a narrative that ignores the fact that Palestinian citizens of Israel were subject to martial law until 1966 and that the state used this period and a series of discriminatory laws to launder land ownership for the purpose of selling it back to itself and using it then for the benefit of one group, Israeli Jews. It is, in short, a narrative that seeks to make the powerful more comfortable with the illegitimate ways with which they achieve this power instead of challenging them. In reality, not only is the occupation and the settlement enterprise directed by the state, it is an extension of the state's ethos, one that seeks maximum Palestinian geography with minimum Palestinian demography. And it uses whatever means it can get away with to demographically engineer majoritarianism for one group and one group only, Israeli Jews. The denial of self-determination to Palestinians in the occupied territories, the inequality of Palestinian citizens of Israel, the denial of refugee rights all stem from a singular system of settler colonial control. In demanding rectification for these three things, the BDS movement recognizes their inseparability and recognizes that it is that system which is and has been the MO of the Israeli state from day one that is the problem. Some will argue, and some on this panel may have, that even if this is true, Given the status of public opinion on this issue, BDS efforts would be more successful if they are aimed only at the occupation or the settlements. They will point to the fact that successful BDS initiatives have largely all been focused on the occupation or the settlements and not on the refugee issue or, or Palestinian citizens of Israel. What we must take from this, though, is not that BDS should abandon two of its three demands but rather that BDS should redouble its efforts to explain the interconnectedness and inseparability of those three. There was a time in this country where, because of the status of public opinion on the issue, it was far easier to organize around voting rights for African Americans than it was to organize around the right for interracial marriage, for example, or against miscegenation laws. In fact, by the time the Civil Rights Act was passed in 1964, only 10% of the American public approved of marriages between blacks and whites. Did this mean that such efforts should not have been made? On the contrary, when we're talking about efforts for social justice, whether it be for Palestinians or any other group, what should be done must not be guided by what is popular, but rather by what is right. Today, by the way, 87% of Americans approve of marriage between the races. While BDS victories focused on the occupation and settlements might not may not be based on all three demands, they should still be welcomed by the BDS movement in general. At this early stage, any efforts that could be made to add pressure to the side of the scales opposite the Israeli state are efforts in the direction of peace and justice. If this means a particular community is only prepared to boycott Dead Sea products, for example, but not necessarily the Israeli state to the fullest extent, then so be it. Every contribution helps. In closing, it's important to keep in mind that the BDS movement is in many ways a nascent movement, and at the same time it is up against significant odds. It's easy today to question what it has accomplished and far more difficult to see a clear path forward. What we know for sure is this. One, all other efforts at changing Israeli state behavior have largely failed just thus far. And two, Palestinians have asked for the solidarity of global civil society in an effort to reclaim their rights. There's lots of work yet to be done, and, it's evi as, and as evidenced by some of the hardworking voices on this panel, there's great enthusiasm to do it. Self-evaluation within a movement is healthy, and it is critical, 
but it must be guided by its principles and not short-term tactical objectives. As the movement grows, remaining steadfast to these principles while laying the educational groundwork to expand tactical victories will be central to its success. Thank you. Just a point of clarification. So making those tactical decisions uh, in a resolution, for example, making the distinction between the occupation and the state of Israel, sometimes a, a resolution would not pass unless you make that distinction. Or what, what's your stance on, on the, for example, the Presbyterian Church targeted specifically the occupation and, and it turned out to be a success for that reason. So are you, what, what's your stance on those tactical decisions? As I said, I think the BDS movement should welcome them and anything that can add pressure in, in, in that direction. We still are targeting uh, you know, uh, an arm of the Israeli state in one way. If, if one's community is not necessarily ready, as Reverend said, this is a process that takes a long time. Um, just because a community is not necessarily ready to go the, to the full extent doesn't mean that their contributions cannot be helpful. So I think they, they have to be welcomed, and they have been by the movement in general. Uh, our final speaker is Dr. Noam Chomsky. Uh, he, received, he received his PhD in linguistics in 1955 from the University of Pennsylvania. He joined the staff of the Massachusetts uh, Institute of Technology in 1955, and in 1961 uh, he was appointed for professor. He has uh, written and lectured widely on multiple topics, including Palestine question, even U.S. foreign policy. He has recently written an op-ed uh, in The Nation criticizing the BDS tactics. Um, Dr. Chomsky.
sanctions against uh, South Africa, which Ronald Reagan had to veto, and then uh, he had to violate them when they were passed over his veto. But by the 1980s, uh, BDS-type actions were beginning to take off in the United States, and they were significant. circumstances in the region are, are straightforward. Uh, there, for the last 40 years, there has been an overwhelming international consensus in support of a uh, uh, two-state two settlement on the international border with guarantees for the rights of each state to live in peace and security within secure and recognized borders. I'm quoting from the UN Security
that's totally changed. He was talking about Skazza at MIT a couple of weeks ago. There's probably seven or eight hundred students there. And it's everywhere. All over the country. Uh, Palestinian solidarity for the last 15, 20 years has become one of the main issues of the main commitments and engagements on college campuses around the country. Well, that's important. Uh, this is pretty normal. If you look over activist movements in the past, young people have typically been on the forefront. So we go to South Africa, the first EDS activity was Similarly, there were activists. It's normal, it's significant, it can have an effect in the long run, it can make a serious change. Um, it it's happened in many other cases, including harder ones. Well, so what about tactics? How should we choose them? Well, first of all, as far as educational and organizational activities are concerned, uh, they're independent of our assessment of the circumstances. That's a separate matter. Activism is think, that you have to consider the likely consequences of your actions. They are quite different from education and organization. And so what kinds of tactics, the tactics that should be chosen are those that will influence what's on the ground and that will have an effect on U.S. public opinion combined uh, with educational organizational efforts and ultimately and BDS can and has served those ends if it's properly executed. And there are many cases that have been properly executed. And uh, probably the most uh, influential case, significant case at the moment, is the European Union. The European Union issued a directive, uh, that they implemented it, you might see, but they issued it to uh, banning any uh, uh, interactions with uh, Israeli institutions that are involved in any way in the illegal occupation. That's quite significant. That's the kind of thing that can have major impact on Israeli policy. It means a lot to them as the biggest trading partner. Uh, and uh, this can influence public opinion. It's used as a basis for the Presbyterian Church uh, uh, decision that the Reverend Dio just spoke about as a major case here. Aimed at the occupation and crucially aimed at American corporations. That's very significant. We want to change U.S. policy. Uh, the people who are significant in determining U.S. policy are the corporate sector. That's where, where, where the force really lies. That's the caterpillar and uh, Motorola and others. Uh, actions directed against them are very significant. that have, in fact, had real consequences are those that are directed on the, at the occupation. Overwhelmingly, that's true. And there's a good reason for it. Uh, the occupation is kind of like a uh, It is a very small group of those that are <laughs> to be illegal to balance everyone. Uh, and this is an exception, uh, a partial exception. Uh, so it's pretty natural that these policies can be successful, and it has uh, it has worked. There are other options. Uh, Reverend Dio uh, mentioned one of the very crucial ones: uh, trying to in, in, uh, focusing on getting the U.S. government to follow U.S. law. Uh, 
we're just uh, running out of time. That's, these are things that are really big pursuits here. They have exactly the kinds of second nature for activists. Uh, it doesn't matter if we think tactics are appropriate. That's interesting, but of no significance. It matters whether others think so. How do we convince them that they're the right thing to do? Uh, and if we have time, I will give examples of, of both types. For the high court and the bad uh, Tactics are going to require honest, assessment, careful assessment of the existing circumstances that includes what's happening on the ground, includes the existing state of the and the impact that tactics will have on it. Notice that this is separate from educational and organizational activities that go on all the time. With regard to tactics, you have to ask, what is the impact on the audience that you're trying to reach? Will it be positive or be negative?
Um, it's evident that the panel is in agreement, uh, one, that as a state actor, the U.S. has played a horrible role in terms of uh, sort of the pursuit of peace and justice uh, for Palestinians. But also, uh, I think that one of the other evident points has been that U.S. public opinion is important. And the two things I'll say to that effect are, one, obviously I spoke about cultural boycott and its significance in shaping U.S. public opinion. And I think that's actually really important. I think that that's, culture is clearly one of the ways, I mean, the Israelis obviously recognize that in founding Brand Israel. Culture is clearly a way to um, affect public opinion in the U.S. Um, but the, I think that the, uh, the other thing worth mentioning is that these movements generally are going to be a over, and unfortunately I would say maybe a 15 or 20 year period that affects the policy level eventually. And for evidence of that, and maybe a, a bit of a different picture of how um, the boycott, divestment, and sanctions campaign around South Africa went, uh, I encourage people to watch at least one or two of the films that are part of the series, Have You Heard from Johannesburg, which is purely about the way that the South African struggle played out, and in particular, takes a close look at how it played out in the US. And one of the things that's very notable there is the role that campuses and also boycott and divestment campaigns in the US um, took a long time before it got to the point that uh, in Congress and in the executive branch, they were willing to concede somewhat, uh, ending their support for apartheid in South Africa. It's almost like a 20 year period. I think we're, uh, we might be ready for questions just for the sake of a little bit of time. Um, we'll start with a question with down here. Um, hello, I'm going to direct this question to um, Dr. Ahud and also to Dr. Chomsky. Um, I am a Lebanese and Palestinian um, physician and a Lebanese American um, physician. And uh, so um, I would like to, and, an activist around Palestine for many okay, years. And I would like to address um, basically the issue of tenure and um, and the way that the process of tenure and the ability of academics to speak out on the issue of Israel um, affects and shapes your beliefs on the importance of boycott as a strategy. I think personally, one of the reasons that I'm a physician is that you know I'm, I've been always a great admirer of the work of Dr. Chomsky, but also felt like it was a bit of a recipe for um, the way that one is able to be critical of Israel and keep your job. And I think that um, that's a really important lesson right now um, as we think the tenure jobs are disappearing um, rapidly. Um, you know, how do you speak about this issue and how, how do you change the academic discourse without a cultural and an academic boycott specifically? I think that was to uh, Tom. I want to keep my job uh, <laughs> on tenured faculty. I would say that what's changed, and other panelists have made reference to it, it really is, I mean, I'm, I'm old enough to remember the early 90s and the first Intifada and what was going on then, and it's much easier to, to have the politics publicly that we all on this panel share in different ways, but that's the outcome of a lot of really potent organizing done by students. We, you know, we faculty have a lot of faith in students and historically that's student power during the Vietnam War and the, the war on Cambodia, et cetera, was really crucial in, in helping to bring those criminal acts to an end and I, I have real faith that that is, I, I see it on changing on campus really remarkably for sure. So, it's a lot less, you know, one is a lot less heroic working today than one would be, you know, 10 or 15 or 20 years ago. On the other hand, there, you know, uh, and I'm sure Dr. Chomsky and Yusuf and others who go to the, come to these events know in, uh, I mean, the kind of opposition that you see, I've organized and been part of campus events, you know, in the last couple of years, there's almost no opposition, at least in the, on the campuses I uh, am part of or, or see events at, uh, and that is Zionist opposition or hostility or, or the sort of thing that Dr. Chomsky was describing even 20 or 15 years ago. 
But there is, you know, in response to the the, uh, the, the BDS and the, the ASA drive and the initiative, there have been these, uh, we've gotten wind of behind the scenes efforts to really either contact the administration, uh, alumni contacting or friends of Tufts contacting the administration and naming names of professors who were uh, signing petitions. But I mean, in all honesty, it's, uh, one does not need to be nearly as heroic as one had to be 10 or 15 or 20 years ago. So Dr. Chomsky, what do you think of the uh, academic repercussions for speak? What do you think of the academic repercussions of speaking up for Palestine? We've heard about a couple of uh, recent incidents. I'll give you a personal example. <laughs> for example, just to give you one case. In uh, 1986, I was invited to UCLA, University of California, to give a, a week of lectures on philosophy. Uh, it was the middle of the Central American War, so I had dozens of invitations to talk on, from student groups to talk on Central America. One faculty member uh, with tenure asked me if I would give a talk on the Middle East. He happened to be somebody who spent half the year in Israel, uh, half the year at UCLA. So I said, sure. Uh, a day later, it was announced, a day later I got a call from the campus police saying uh, they wanted to have uniformed police with me every minute I was on campus. I refused. Uh, they had undercover police with me every minute. It's not hard to detect an undercover police. <laughs> 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 Campus, I had undercover police so. there. They finally did have the talk in by then the biggest auditorium on campus at airport security, one way, one door open, everyone had to be inspected. Uh, when I left the campus the next couple of days, a huge attack began, not only against me, but that against the professor who had invited me with an effort to try to take his camera away. Well, that was 1986. Today, I mean, it's a UCLA event. I mean, a thousand people show up, you can't get a hostile question. And the only hostile questions are, why are you so mild? <laughs> it's just changed radically. Now, there are a few cases, bad cases, cases of uh, faculty who have been subjected to rejecting tenure or a, a harsh attack and so on. But the fact of the matter is they're increasingly scattered. It was much worse than this in the past. And not only on Israel Palestine, but on other things. Like the Vietnam War, for example. Uh, by now it's it's a lot easier. It's not perfect. Long way to go. But the situation circumstances have changed. Put in a better meeting like this, uh, 50 years ago, almost not mentioned. For the sake of time, I'm going to take two questions from both ends of the line. Uh, this question is primarily directed to uh, Yusuf Menenger. Uh, probably one of the most major obstacles that I see for wider adoption of BDS is the uh, Palestinian Authority's position on the matter, as they sort of oscillate between being generally against it and for a, a variant that's focused on settlement products. What, in your way or opinion, is the way to deal with this? Can we take a question from that end as well? Just make a brief, please. Hi, um, I'm an English as a second language teacher at Gulf Nationals, and my students are in their 20s and 30s. They specifically want to know in their learning what websites, books, or organizations uh, explain the Israel-Palestinian conflict simply and also without hate speech or propaganda. So, Yusuf, do you want to take the question on the PLO? And I think one thing you have to keep in, in, in mind about this is that um, you know, the Palestinian Authority, just like you know the Israelis are an American client, the Palestinian Authority is also an American client, right? I mean, the, the, the majority of their budget comes from contributions from, if not um, the United States, Western nations in Europe as well that are in lockstep with, with Washington on the vast majority of these issues. So 
I would not let the statements or principles of um, essentially an American client on this issue be the guide on what it is that Palestinians want. Uh, I would focus instead on what Palestinian civil society is talking about. And when you talk to members of Palestinian society, uh, representatives of institutions within Palestinian civil society, and just Palestinians in general, um, you'll hear things that are, let's just say, a lot different than what you might hear from the official spokespeople who are concerned about meeting payroll for the security services and other uh, you know, people that they have to keep employed on a monthly basis. So um, I, I, would, I would focus on that, um, the, the fact that they are compromised in that sense and not let that be such a distraction. Um, on the other question, if anyone else wants to <laughs> two of the Israeli army brigades, the Golani and the Givadi. Um, people don't know. So the, those types of products come up uh, at the US campaign's website and the occupation.org. Adana New York, which I mentioned working with, has a top 10 or 12 list. Um, and there are a number of different sites that actually provide that stuff. I mean, maybe but if you see a list that's 5,000 items long, yeah. maybe we can uh, put a list up on the website or something if you want to share information a more specific. Sure. Does anyone else want to mention any we can, we can just share them with just for the sake of time. Um, so two more questions from both ends as well. Are we, are we actually, we're over time. Um, so we can, can we take one more question? One more question. You see, one more question. Okay. Um, a question for Dr. Chomsky. Um, could you please talk more about um, how to encourage an open debate on tactics within the BDS movement when emotions are often very, very high?
feel the jitter. We ought to do it. You know, it's the kind of thing we do, but this is not the way to do it. Uh, this has been true in the BDS movement, too. So it takes a... Somebody mentioned the Columbia. Yeah, yeah. Well, that was a very successful effort. It was 2003, I think. I was involved in it. It was a, uh, it was a very successful effort. It was focused on the occupation. It was educational. People understood, could.